last year I published my first book, a memoir called The Puma Years. And thanks for coming to my talk, How to Write Your Memoir. Um, so I'm just going to begin with one of my favorite quotes about memoir writing. It's by the author and feminist Bell Hooks. I gather together the dreams, fantasies, experiences that preoccupied me as a girl, that stay with me and appear and reappear in different shapes and forms in all my work. Without telling everything that happened, they document all that remains most vivid. Now, I love this image of gathering, the notion of going out and collecting those seeds of passion, of dream and fantasy and trauma, the seeds that make up our stories. And it really stayed with me. I had this quote written up on the wall whilst I was writing the countless drafts of my book. And when I say countless, I mean countless. <laughs> writing a memoir is no easy feat. At least it wasn't for me. And for me, I think this was largely because of two things. The first, the very blurry line between what is fact and what is fiction. And the second, the complexities of writing about yourself and by extension, your community, your family, your friends, whatever that means to you. Virginia Woolf nailed it for me when she said, here I come to one of the memoir writer's difficulties. One of the reasons why, though I read so many, so many are failures. They leave out the person to whom things happened. What I love so much about the Bell Hooks quote, I guess, is that it embodies the need explained by Woolf not only not to leave out, but also to gather up in, glorious, in a glorious, proud and vivid package. It's a kind of guide, or it was for me, how to write about myself with honesty and integrity, how to share those most vivid things that shape me and how to do it bravely and without fear. It took me over 10 years to write The Pume Years, to navigate my way through the muddy waters of creative nonfiction, self-exploration, self-flagellation. And yet, through it all, I tried to hold on to that idea of being a gatherer, of collecting all that love and passion, those dreams, fantasies, experiences, in order to create an end object, a book, this book. I was really determined to write this book. I didn't know what form it was going to take. I didn't know what it would look like. I didn't know if it would ever be a thing, an actual, real, physical thing. And I most certainly didn't know how hard and long the journey would be. But I think in part it's happened because I was so determined, one might say obsessed, positively obsessed, in the words of sci-fi writer Octavia Butler. Before I go into why exactly I was so determined to write and some of the highs and lows of the whole process, I'll tell you first a little bit about what the book's about. It started... Over 15 years ago, on the side of this road in the Bolivian jungle. I was in my early 20s. I was a bit aimless. I'm white and relatively privileged. So I had the luxury of quitting the marketing job I was doing in London. And because I didn't know what I wanted to do, I bought a three month ticket to Bolivia. I didn't know much about Bolivia. It was in South America. It had the highest proportion of indigenous peoples on the continent. It was the cheapest country to travel in at that time, and it looked beautiful. I traveled on my own, again, a bit aimlessly, volunteering, working a bit, sightseeing. Until about two thirds into my trip, I was stranded in a tiny town, Bolivia's last stop before the Amazon proper. I found a flyer for an animal refuge. There was a happy picture of a monkey on the front, and I thought, sure. It was only a six hour ride away in a local bus. I wasn't that interested in working with animals, but I thought I'd give it a go. I turned up late at night to a ramshackle jungle camp. I was given a dorm room filled with rats, howling monkeys swung through the trees and a wild pig rampaged and other volunteers stolen underwear in her mouth. There was no internet, no electricity, no hot water. I was given a choice. If I committed to staying for a month, I could be assigned to work with a rescued puma. At that point, I didn't really know what a puma was. Mountain lion, cougar, catamount, they were just these ideas in my head. Until the next day when I was taken out to meet her, Waira. Her name means wind in Quechua. 
Like most of the animals in the sanctuary, she'd been rescued from the illegal pet trade. Her story was similar to most. Her mother had been shot by hunters and then she'd been sold on the black market. She turned up at the sanctuary at 10 months old. When I met her, she was three and she was utterly terrifying. At that point, I didn't have the awareness to understand that she was also terrified. In my eyes, she was a hissing, snarling puma who I was expected to put on a lead and walk through the jungle in order to provide her with daily enrichment outside of her forested enclosure. I was terrified, hot and sweaty, bitten by countless mosquitoes, unfit, covered in mud, finding cockroaches in my meals, having rats and monkeys crawl over me at night. I thought I would last 24 hours, tops. But as the days went by, at first I was too tired to consider leaving. But then, without even really realizing it, surrounded by those wild animals and the roar of the jungle, living and working with Bolivians, with young people from the local community, working every day in the Amazon jungle with this puma, Wyra, walking with her, running with her, chasing monkeys with her, napping in the sun with her for hours on end, helping her be just a little bit wild in a world that said she could never be wild again. I started to feel something I'd never felt before, at least not to this extent. Purpose, passion, joy. This puma didn't trust me. She yo-yoed between hating me and ignoring me. She was so traumatized, so terrified of the world she found herself in, so confused over the fact that she was meant to be free, but didn't have the skills and abilities to survive on her own. When the month was over, I stayed. I learned the stories of the rescued monkeys who howled on the roofs of the dorms. I learned the stories of the jaguars and the other pumas who found their own homes in the sanctuary and, like Waira, got walked every day. I learned the stories of the community that had created the sanctuary and welcomed me into their family. Waira grew used to me. Months passed and I missed my flight home. And over time, as I began to trust her, she began to trust me, slowly, tentatively, miraculously. I did things I could never have imagined possible. I fought out of control wildfires with no resources or help, just a desperate, desperate group of people with a few machetes and wet blankets against the raging infernos that spread across the sanctuary. I slept on the road under the stars until the number of logging trucks increased so much that it wasn't even safe to walk on that road anymore. I watched hunters pass by with dead jaguars slung over their motorbikes. I witnessed climate change and deforestation and the wreckage consequently wrought on both human and non-human communities. I spent months wading through neck-high swamps, swam side by side with caimans and anacondas and squeezed worm's eggs out from my skin. And a puma became my best friend. Eventually, I had to go back to England. But this was the beginning of the love story that would last for the next 15 years of my life. I stayed that first time for almost two years in Bolivia. When I left, it was because I thought I should. I needed to do something real, get a proper job, find a partner, settle down, be normal. But the moment I got back to the UK, I knew it was lost. All I wanted to do was get back to Bolivia and to Waira. I was heartbroken that I'd left behind this community of strange and tormented creatures, both humans and not, fighting every day for a little piece of wildness and identity. I worked for six months in order to save up enough money to return. And during those months, the only thing that really helped me process what had happened, that helped me put into focus these incredible experiences I'd had, that helped me realize I was actually really and truly head over heels in love with a puma was to write. I spent every day writing about Waira, the jungle, the people and animals who become my family, and not only writing, but drawing, making art, trying to catalog and explain these feelings I was having that didn't fit into normal conversation down the pub. Oh, right, so you're in love with a puma? Yeah, but did you watch Bake Off this weekend? 
I wrote the first draft of a memoir. Then, unsure and full of doubt, I turned it into a novel. I thought it would be easier, safer. Then I reworked it all over again until it wasn't quite one or the other, and I put it away in a drawer and flew back to Bolivia. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.